Okay. Well, I hit escape. Maybe I shouldn't hit escape. Uh, let's hit F5. Nope. Uh. Uh. <laughs> yeah. You can tell I've used PowerPoint very recently. Um, all right, so I'm Connor Waldock. I'm here to talk about uh, grid status and you know what it's like to kind of try and clean up and centralize a lot of data that's ostensibly public, but realistically, um, you know, pretty pretty challenging to try and acquire um, and make make usable, and why that's important, you know, going forward. Right. Um, so, you know, who who am I? Um, I am very much not the engineering programming side of grid status. If you have any questions on that, I will try and remember them and relay them to Max, who's the founder with that background. Um, <coughs> I've been in energy energy markets for over a decade now. Everything from hydropower and biofuels, carbon markets, to virtual power plants and grid scale battery development. Um, you know, generally through the prism of the deregulated markets, energy economics, their design, and the regulatory process, which sounds like a lot. <laughs> My last job uh, at a battery developer before going full-time at grid status, I led the siting, analytics, and regulatory teams, um, which is you know, a real mouthful but it's hard to you know, not have your hands in everything when you want to be sort of fully involved. And it's that background that kind of leads well into knowing what the issues are that people face, right? Oh, I need to stand closer to this. Um, knowing what folks face when they're trying to do something new um, in energy, right? Particularly as it relates to the markets. The markets are very public representations of what's happening they're also a little deceptive, right? You look at real-time prices spiking in ERCOT, and you're like, oh, this means something. You know, it's $5,000 in April across the whole grid. Um, this, you know, matters a lot. Most energy's clearing in the day ahead at a much lower price, right? These are potentially ephemeral price spikes. They still matter, people react in real time, but right now, they maybe don't matter as much as they do in the future, right? And so the motivating element for grid status originally, and you know, still today, obviously hasn't been that long, um, is that the future electric grid depends on data. Um, and you know, occasionally you hear sort of someone might scoff at that a bit, like, oh, well, it's the, it's the infrastructure, it's the steel on the ground, right? And obviously that matters a lot. But how those pieces communicate with each other, with everything else, how you optimize it, how people think about it, and how people solve issues related to getting more of that seal on the ground, a lot of that comes back to data. And when it comes to that data, everyone working you know, on a clean, reliable grid need access to it, right? So it's this sort of twin concept, you know, it's one complete sentence of the future of the grid relies on clean, reliable um, data for a clean and reliable grid. Um, and these use cases extend kind of a lot further than they used to, right? If you, um, you know, we're thinking about energy data 15, 20, 30 years ago, there's a relatively limited subset of people that are really interested in this, people and businesses. So, you know, energy traders come to mind you know, sort of off the off the top for a lot of folks. Enron, obviously, and then the diaspora into all these other trading organizations. And then, you know, asset owners and operators, right? From before there were any sort of market signals, before, you know, deregulation and that process in the US, um, to even the early stages of the market where not a lot of knowledge was available and people maybe still didn't know kind of what was happening. Today, you know, you, you could be sort of a hobbyist and interested in energy because it's on the front page of every major newspaper, it feels like every week at this point in the US, whether it's demand growth, weather, climate change, investments. Um, you just wanna know like, hey, there were tornadoes 
in Nebraska last week and also Oklahoma. It was actually a really bad week for tornadoes. Um, did that affect like the prices in the power market, right? You're just a person that wants to log on and look at that. It's almost impossible. <laughs> um, unless you're there at the exact right moment and you go to SPP, the, the grid operator for sort of the Great Plains. Um, if you go to their website, you find their LMP contour map, which is also not necessarily easy to find unless you know the right terms to Google and, and you get there. And you're there at the moment it happens and you can see it. The next five minute interval, it flips, it's gone. Um, you know, if, if you're a startup, you're new in the space and you have an idea or you're, you know, you're, you're a startup, you're thinking about becoming a company, right? How do you pressure test that idea? How do you have any concept of like what you actually need to execute on that um, without making a big investment in your own infrastructure to get data to test your actual idea um, or going out to like the vendors that have mostly dealt with uh, you know large companies that have existed for a long time right um, academics we've heard I feel like a fair amount and I was talking to a professor yesterday uh, yeah you are <laughs> yeah and you know, if, if you are doing a class, um, let's say you're teaching like a master's program in energy policy and economics, um, that was a program that I did a while ago. And you're sitting there like, I wanna do a, you know, a real project, and like what was happening on the grid? Where can I get data for that? Unless you also have the capability to hit up these APIs or you know, scrape the CSV, stitch them all together, you're just gonna be incapable of doing something based on real data, right? Why not bring the practical into these spaces. Um, even when it comes down to the people implementing, writing and implementing policy, right? Like if you are a state office and you know that you're Illinois and you have goals around solar and battery deployments and you have ideas about like what is being put in the ground because you're you know, ultimately signing the checks out for these incentives, but you don't really know what they're producing necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, basically everything around the edges here are the types of use cases that we hear about or people that we are providing data for either from the open source core or our hosted APIs and products, which I'm gonna get into. Um, so sort of touch on this a little bit, but you know, when you need energy data, you have kind of two options where it's do it yourself or use a vendor. Um, I actually would say there's a third option or it's, it's not really an option, it's door zero. If you just, you know, I wanna do something with energy, I need energy data. You go to Google, search for energy data. You're gonna see a lot of reports, you're gonna see a lot of static graphs. Um, so it's gonna be a DOE report from two years ago, it's gonna be I, IEA numbers updated annually, but it's like 16 charts for 70 countries. And you know, it's tough to build a business around that or like figure out an idea, right? Um, this being you know, an open source uh, focused conference, you can guess which door grid status started with, um, it's, it's door one. <coughs> so uh, getting close to two years ago now, grid status, the open source um, uh, project on GitHub was started. And this is before, before I was involved. Um, so the other, one of the other founders, Max, previously built um, and exited a data engineering machine learning focused company. So nothing to do with energy, but it's very strong on sort of the programming engineering piece. So as Santiago mentioned, it's hard for <laughs> uh, like ECE and computer programming to come together. I would say it's even, it's much harder for like energy policy and economics uh, on my side to come together with like data engineering. Uh, I am probably the prototypical person who can write some Python will start an open source project and it's dead in a week. Um, and so, you know, having the other side of like a very competent, you know, data engineering professional allows that to not, not happen, right? And it just started with fuel mix. Um, so, you know, sort of typical path of like, uh, if solar panels and an EV, what, it, I, there's data here, right? Maybe they can communicate with each other. Um, and that's where a lot of this stops, right? You see hundreds, I don't know, maybe thousands of companies now that are like, someone from tech acquired some distributed energy assets in and around their home and they see data streams and they wanna build a company. Um, 
Max kind of took the next step and said, well, what's, what's actually powering the grid, right? Like, I want to know about that. Did some Googling, discovered he's in Chicago, and he's, I'm in this thing called ComEd. ComEd is part of this thing called PJM. PJM is a market surrounded by another market called MISO. Both of those markets are in this larger thing called the Eastern Interconnection. And it turns out the US doesn't just have one grid. It doesn't even have just have three grids. Um, you know, you mostly only hear about three, but it's a little more fragmented in spots. Um, so you took the step just getting fuel mix in. And it turns out that there, if you go, you, know, you go to GitHub and you search for like ISO data API, something like that, you'll see uh, like a lot of projects. You know, there's a lot of people who have done something with this, you know, off and on over the years, but not that many of them have continued and kept building out more and more scrapers and are still, you know, continuously maintained, right? And as early users, uh, we really, uh, you know, really enjoyed using it, right? It's very clean, very modern. Someone who is not coming from energy, building the type of tools that they were building for machine learning engineers who want just very clean data, right? You don't want to worry about all the feature engineering and everything else you have to do to make it work. You just want it to work. Um, so pretty quickly, there was um, like a, a UI. So the website gridstatus.io, which is like the main kind of platform now, um, was a few months later and it was just like, how can, how can it actually live up to the name grid status, right? The status of the grid, people being able to just see and look and know more about what's happening. Obviously this is pretty bare bones, but just from the start, so like on the, on the left, sort of left, oh, no, on the right up there, oh, whatever. The ERCOT specific page, um, I don't, for people who have been to like the ERCOT dashboard that ERCOT maintains, that's, not as interesting. Um, you know, there's not as much data there, it's not as, you know, pretty or well organized, but this sort of smaller table of like what is happening in every ISO right now at a high level, like that doesn't exist publicly. Um, still doesn't, didn't then, doesn't really now. And that was sort of the, a key kind of like unlocking moment of what are people really interested in here? Part of it is this like consolidation and having everything in one spot. Maybe you've maintained 10, 15 different scrapers from all these different markets from the data you're interested in and then you're, you're still clicking through all this different stuff you, or you have all these tabs open. What if you could just have it all in one spot? And so 12 months later, um, this is what grid status looks like. So you know, we've developed all these new tools, whether it's uh, you know, cleaning up and adding to the ISO specific pages. Now that for the most part, I would say they are, um, you know, more informative than a lot of the ISO's default dashboards. Uh, we built, you know, custom dashboarding, combine any data from any market, bring it all together, embed outside stuff, um, you know, stuff like org support to connect your database directly in with all the data that we have. And you could, you know, have your positions side by side with, with market data. Um, and the, the map is in preview right now, happy to send a link to anyone um, while we're still testing it out. But oh yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to see in light mode. But um, it uh, is a fully public, real-time nodal price map, you know, historical search, all of that. Click on a node, get the data associated with that node. You can just download it directly, charts, graphs, all of that. Um, these are the types of things that in the past you would have to go to um, you know, one, of, one of these vendors, one of these legacy vendors that's been around for a while, and you know, no shade to them, like they've been really successful and a lot of people use them. Um, but they are built around the previous market segment, right? So they're built around the energy traders that are making a lot of money, and this is just you know, a line item for them that doesn't matter, or they're built around the asset owners and operators that need this data to understand and you know optimize their plants and systems, but there was no one else providing it, so you just go with the same vendor. And again, it's the same deal where they're operating at a scale where you know expensive and complicated integrations are just sort of part of the business. Um, so this is sort of the evolution from the open source core into having um, you know all these posted piece of grid status. Um, 
as well. And sort of the last piece that was kind of, you know, we've used foundational to what GridStatus is, was the blog. And the reason that, you know, we felt this was really important was to demonstrate how you could use this to understand the grid, right? Um, why, why does this matter? Um, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of great, like, technical blogs on, uh, you know, like, Cloudflare, I think, has, like, a really great blog. Um, but it's very focused on like the technical engineering aspects of what they do. Uh, as of now, at least, there's no like grid status blog and like this is our back end data engineering. It's all about how do you use this stuff and like understand it to engage you know, a broader audience. And particularly early on, it's really helpful as a forcing function to decide what to develop. Like we have an idea. We saw that uh, wildfires in Quebec are really messing with New York ISOs behind the meter solar forecast. Can we go build a scraper for that data set today, write a blog post tomorrow describing the flaws in that system, right? So before you have any customers or you have anything else, it's sort of this internal flywheel to keep things going, right? Like add momentum to it. Um, and also, you know, it's helpful having <laughs> some of the founding team not being from energy to prevent the, ac the you know, death by acronyms. Um, you know, energy is obviously not immune to that, so you know, having that piece there is um, you know, just really, really helpful for making it as readable as it can be when you're talking about maybe the merit order and, and where price is clear. There's a limit to you know, how obvious you can make that. Um, so really a lot of what it, you know, I just went over was the process of how we're translating just pretty modern and like in some cases kind of standard software company concepts into this energy data space where now and in the future we need a lot more accessibility and flexibility. Um, and these are just not things that have been as possible to date. Um, so you know, open source core, uh, product led, right? So for folks that are you know, like paying customers, we're not uh, going out and like making sales or anything like that. People are coming to us because they see some product or something they're interested in and they want to know like, oh, well, can we do more? Can we get, you know, like an SLA or things for the enterprise side? But we have folks down from individuals who want just a ton of access to, um, you know, our hosted API. So like, you know, maybe a lot of queries or just, you know, billions and billions of rows, you know, some amount there. Um, academics, like I said, professors. Um, there's a lot of people at different universities um, using grid status currently. And it's all self-service, right? Like anyone, you go to gridstatus.io, click like sign in or sign up, go through your Gmail, you have an API key, just start pulling data, make a dashboard, set alerts. I want to know if the price that this node in SPP exceeds $3,000. So that alert. You, know, you get an email or however you want to get that, and you can just sort of go forward and have access to all this that was, you know, pretty difficult to get and consolidate. Um, and so in terms of like lowering barriers to access, which you know we've been touching on, but it's a lot of it is providing data to users how they want to use it, right? So the energy industry, obviously there's a lot of engineering. There's, um, you know, a lot of great, great programmers. There's a lot of people, you know, as Santiago mentioned several times, that are just using Excel, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I, the, no, yeah, the, the questions we get about when is the Excel add-on coming? Um, like that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm the head of product, but I'm, I'm not gonna disclose where that is in the roadmap or if it's in the roadmap. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, here it's us kind of trying to meet people at every level across the spectrum from like the full enterprise, the snowflake experience. You want the whole data warehouse. You want to be able to run your queries, just let it go. You don't want to have to, you know, go through an API and query over time and then do your calculation, just one, one SQL query and you're done. To point and click, uh, every graph you can just go download, right? You can download the image, you can download CSVs of the series in it, make your own graph and get that as well. Um, so a lot of flexibility there. And then when it comes to APIs, we have both the open source and the hosted. Um, so, you know, just 
trying to do the full spectrum of like flexible data accessibility, um, which you know has been just doesn't kind of exist across this this full space. Um, if you go and try and find like energy data APIs, um, you'll see a whole lot of different things. The EIA probably the first thing that pops up, and I, the EIA's API is is great. Um, but they are limited in like what they're pulling in. They actually launched a dashboard two or three weeks ago on the like ISOs and RTOs, um, which which didn't previously exist, right? And those markets have been around for more than 20 years, 25 years, um, and it just speaks to things that maybe should be a public good to some extent. It's still difficult to to build those and get them off the ground, right? So we're trying to bridge that gap between what should be you know a public good for people to like understand and learn about the grid and energy, which is only you know, more important day to day, up to the full enterprise customers who again, just want like, look, we don't wanna deal with these trillions of rows of data, or whatever, we just wanna get it and, and be done. Um, so here's sort of an example of like the building in public aspect. So again, for the kind of this type of data, you want it in bulk, you want it programmatically, you want it clean and nice. You're normally going to vendors where it's all, you know, in this back room, right? And we've heard a lot about like closed vendors on the, um, you know, on the power modeling side. <laughs> you know, we heard from, uh, you know, MISO and GE yesterday on, or you speaking in your personal capacity as people who work at those, <laughs> um, you know, I guess it's more FERC, we have to worry about that. Um, and then, you know, Santiago just now as well. Um, so, you know, this is pretty typical still, right, of like, uh, you're, you're a software company, you have an idea in Slack, um, and then you, you build it, right? With the way that we're thinking about this, it's like you can have an idea in Slack, like records, people really like records, but they're kind of hard to get right now. Again, it's the, you're gonna pull one year of nodal, uh, five minute price data in MISO, it's gonna be like 256 million rows or something. Um, ERCOT would be, I don't know, like eight times as much as that. So pretty rapidly, it's just totally inaccessible for someone to then calculate a stat based on that. So what if we're just, you know, providing this in a, in a basic way for folks? You come with an idea, you see if people are interested. It's like, wow, people on Twitter and LinkedIn really like just seeing records on the grid. Um, so we build it, and this was sort of like a really quick, just a few days last spring project, and it drives a ton of traffic and interest. Like, people really care <laughs> about what the records are on the grid, and that is part of where we are now in the energy transition, right? 15, 20 years ago, records maybe not uh, being set with the same regularity, right? Um, and it gets people who are, you know, not even in energy. You know, I picked Patrick Collison because I feel like that's a name that people might kind of know, the Stripe. Um, you know, he's not an energy person, but he's like, oh, this is, this is cool, right? And it's engaging people across the spectrum that maybe could build something, fund something, have an idea, whatever. And as a, as a side note, I was looking last night, and we track every record has like the top 10 current days, moments, for, for that, and I was looking at our solar records, and there's 80 of them, because there's some behind the meter solar, um, ISO solar, and 79, as of last night, 79 of the 80 top 10 solar records we track, we're all set in 2024. Um, and that, maybe you say, like, well, yeah, obviously, lots, lots of solar's going on the grid right now, right? Like, that's not surprising. But if you look even a year ago, um, that wasn't the case. Like, obviously solar's still going on the grid, but these records are not set like you install new solar capacity, a record is set the next day, right? The conditions need to be right, everything needs to be operational, a lot of different things need to align for you to set a new record. Um, so right now, you know, with all of that happening in the moment, it just speaks to kind of the paradigm shift we're in, particularly after COVID, supply chain issues, you know, interconnection queues, ongoing issue with getting, getting solar, uh, any resource in the ground in the US. And you can sort of see like 
some amount of breaking through that in this moment. Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised to look at the amount of solar in MISO and PJM right now and how quickly that's growing. Um, this is also an example of a lot of news media, you know, really like to look and see stuff like this and then toss something off about it. And then they can get, you know, a little more accurate about some part of the grid, right? And not relying on something they heard interviewing someone at a company that has a specific point of view, right? Like we can just put that data out there, it's accessible. It previously wasn't. Um, so now we get into like why a lot of this is, is difficult or, oh, sorry, fruit fly. Um, difficult or, or problematic. Um, and actually talking to, I think it was in conversation with uh, Chris Atkins from MISO yesterday. You know, he was, uh, I think you mentioned, man, why can't it just be like stock market data? Like you could just Google any stock, right? And you can see uh, what the price is, what it's been, sort of what's going on, the events on the timeline. And I think a lot of that comes down to like the accessibility, but also just the complexity of this data. And you know, we would like to be more of that plumbing, right? Where then maybe you could just check what the price is of a node um, instead of downloading a CSV for a day, understanding where it is, and you know, figuring all of that out. Um, so you know, energy data is really high, really high volume. Um, so it goes down to you know a second or less. Um, you know, we pull frequency data where that's available, and that's important on like a second by second basis, right? To sort of understand the balance of the grid and if anything's going wrong, up to years out, right? Obviously, there's the, the planning models. You know, some of what Santiago was talking about, but even when you think about like a capacity market, like a resource adequacy construct, where the prices in certain markets are for years in the future. That's like clear, actionable data in single points. Maybe there's like 10 zones in an ISO, so there's 10 prices for three years from now. And that is important and useful data. It's very small, but just building, you know, you want to build an engineer in a way that can accommodate that and accommodate that one second data, right? Um, and just variety, uh, obviously, you know, same, same kind of deal there. And it's collected from all these different places, similar names for different things, different names for the same. Um, so, you know, some examples over there, like time, at least one person mentioned daylight savings time yesterday. You know, it's kind of a pox for anyone dealing with time series data in the US. Some ISOs use U UTC, that's great. Others use their local time zone. Uh, one of them just uses the like the standard time of their time zone for the whole year, but they still have these discontinuities around daylight savings time. So the first time you see that, you're like, I, what the heck is happening here? Um, day ahead is typically considered like an hourly basis. You just get these hourly chunks the next day. Real time, it's priced in five minute intervals. Uh, you know, when you get into gas, which is a really critical <laughs> element for the US grid um, and, you know, going to be that way for a while, it, it certainly looks like. Um, they have completely different hours. It's a 10 a.m. to 10 a.m. day. Like, you can imagine the difficulties <laughs> if you are a system operator and your gas plant prices change at 10 a.m. every day and everything else is, is priced, you know, in this, like, these normal day hours. Um, so just, like, collecting all this and understanding it is difficult. Um, you know, ruck. Um, if you're like an ERCOT observer, you might have heard they've been over-rucking the last few years. And these are reliability unit commitments. And that's kind of a function of the post uh, winter storm Yuri environment where they're like even more concerned about reliability um, than they used to be. And so they're just trying to make sure on the reliability side, like get more units online, get more units online. They're using this mechanism to get more units online. Ruck is also a thing in Kaiso, and it's pretty similar, but it has different words. Um, NISO, many, many years ago, and th this might be apocryphal, this is just what I heard from <laughs> working with folks who were there, is that when they were designing their market, uh, you know, they had the economists and the engineers and then also an English major in the room. And the English major said, locational isn't a word. We can't have locational marginal prices. They have to be location-based marginal prices. So in NISO, you don't see the term LMP, it's LBMP. Um, and honestly, as a non-engineer, I kind of, I'm here for the English major being like that. Uh, guys, that's not a word. 
Um, it's a tough, tough, um, tough road to hoe sometimes and actually win. Um, or, you know, RTC. Generally, it means real-time co-optimization, right? Like, in the moment of the grid, your energy and your ancillary services are being considered and optimized at the same time. Uh, but again, I don't know why I'm picking on NISO, but there it's real-time commitment. It's the five-minute engine that commits units and determines prices. Um, so you just have all these little discontinuities all over the place. And I think that you know, part of what we're trying to bring to this, the accessibility also extends to having um, you know, deep energy market knowledge of like what arcane thing is this and how can we clean it up present it, make it accessible um, to folks who shouldn't have to know all of that, right? Um, you know, I think the, the ISOs, it's, you know, no fault of theirs, like there wasn't a reason they needed to be data vendors, right? And they're not data vendors. They make a lot accessible, partially, well, uh, partially to largely because of, you know, regulation, what FERC says about what should be accessible. Um, but that's not their main role, right? They are reliability organizations concerned with keeping their grids, you know, running reliably. So it's sort of just this accident that a lot of this data is public. Um, it doesn't, you know, doesn't have to be. Speaking of, oh, that's, uh, sorry, one more first. Um, so just sort of another example, topography versus topology. This is sort of one of my favorite uh, difficulties when it comes to energy data, a lot of people uh, get mixed up here, right? Electrical topology is just, just not equivalent to the topography of the real world, right? So energy market boundaries are informed by the transmission grid. The transmission grid and who owns parts of it is, is political, but the electrons don't care about that, right? Um, when I was working in NISO, we'd be like, ah, oh, there's loop flows coming around the Great Lakes. And those are, were largely being affected and uh, controlled to some extent by PARs, phase angle regulators, the transmission equipment that sort of clamp down and control the flow on transmission lines that were operated by MISO and Ontario in Michigan. So you have these, this uh, physical grid equipment in Michigan affecting flows between MISO and ISO, the Ontario ISO, that is causing pricing and congestion problems in western New York. And this is, you know, uh, really difficult to show, visualize, explain, and connect the data. Um, this is, you know, power doesn't flow intuitively. It doesn't flow in a way you can control unless you're physically doing something, like with a PAR. I think there are uh, quadrature boosters in at least England. I don't know the rest of Europe. Um, but people really like maps, right? Like, I love maps. Maps are, are super information dense. They're very intuitive. If you're looking at a nodal price map of the US across tens of thousands of price nodes, you understand a lot about like, oh, it's cheap in the Northwest because I know there's hydropower there. And like, oh, it's expensive in Texas right now because it's hot. If you took all those points and put them in a scatter plot, it means nothing to you. <laughs> um, unless you're, you're a crazy person. Like, you know, maybe me or Santiago, or, you know, I'm sure there's a few other people here. Um, you know, it's really hard to parse that information. So if you can put it in this form of a map, great, you know, people get it. And then, you know, in, in the bottom here, I have two different maps from ISA New England. Um, on the right, um, you know, they have sort of like a one-line-ish diagram with a bulk power system. Um, so this is like actually the transmission lines, generators, substations, how the, not how the power flows, but how, sort of how it would flow on the physical grid. On the other side, we have like the stylized geographic map. People go, oh, okay, northern Maine looks like it has a separate grid, which it does. You can't really get that intuitively unless you've spent years staring at this from the other map, right? You need the complicated and detailed map to understand how power might actually flow, but if you want to translate that out to people, um, the normal people, you need the other map. Um, and then this is also a great example of the quirks of what data is and isn't public. Um, ISO New England makes both of these just available as PDFs on their website. I think they're, they're the only ISO that makes this so easy. 
Um, this is secured critical information in most other ISOs. Even when I was um, working as a market monitor for um, some of the ISOs, like it wasn't easy to get these types of maps um, from them. Even though we're, we're getting a clone of their database every night, getting a transmission map was like pulling teeth. Um, so you, you never know what you're gonna necessarily get. Um, and that's, you know, this, it's not always public. I am not uh, quite old enough to have been working pre-9-11, but from talking to folks in the industry that were around back then, uh, a lot of this was easier to get uh, in the US back then, in terms of like physical transmission infrastructure information. Um, it, you know, a lot of stuff went behind a wall, uh, the concerns, you know, terrorism and, and everything else. Only recently, like last six, seven years, some of it started appearing again. There's a Homeland Security, like GIS portal that had transmission and substation data. Then, I don't know, two years ago, you might have seen some news, like a few uh, substation attacks, the substation data disappeared. Um, this was never like great, perfect, clean data, but it was kind of the only public way to access that in the US. Um, you know, as I was just saying, the ISOs have this you know, wildly varying public access for the same types of data. Some it's public, some it's not. Um, you know, I was talking to someone at Catalyst, uh, there uh, yesterday, they do a great job with the FERC data, which is, um, you know, in, in these custom formats that are, you know, really annoying, <laughs> um, really, really uh, obnoxious to kind of work your way through. And sometimes you have to make a FOIA request. You're like, ah, it's just easier if I, if I do that, maybe it'll actually give me a CSV instead of an XBRL. Um, you know, critical energy information, you apply for that, you get approval it's still only available at an ISO's discretion, right? Like, you can apply and you think you have a good case, and I've never been, you know, denied, like, working for a company and doing this, but it's still possible that you won't get access to it. And once you go outside the ISO system, there's even less of, like, a public chain on how to do that, right? If you want to work in a, uh, not a, a regulated region with a vertical utility, theoretically, a lot of the same pathways are there, but it's not necessarily easy. Um, you know, again, Santiago, the, the planning information and models are just, they're tough to get. They're tough to parse. Like, I'm very interested in looking at grid kale after this. <laughs> See what I put in there. Again, with gas, only interstate gas pipelines have to post receipt and delivery data. This was a problem um, in Texas with the winter storm URI, where there's no insight into most of the gas delivery if you're not delivering or receiving gas in Texas because it is producing so much that most of the major pipelines are just in the state and don't have to cross, um, you know, cross in other states to make the economics work. So there's just no insight into all of that. And then the, the sort of, um, you know, secret piece of all of this has always been, if you have enough money, none of this matters. If you have enough money, you can pay and get access to this, um, which is, has just been a prohibitive barrier, right, for folks who, don't have that, like I said, or test something out, a hobbyist, someone new, professors, academics. I think yesterday we definitely heard about the, you know, the difficulty with having, I think at the beginning, enough historical data to like run these models. I think Doug's uh, opening keynote, he mentioned that. It's like we have an idea of how to solve this. We don't have uh, agreement on like the system architecture on the data side, and these models aren't running with enough years of data. Well, one of the reasons they're not running with enough years of data is because it's hard to get those years of data. It's hard, it's expensive, and the ability to, even if you sign sort of one-off agreement, like redistribute it in any way, like if you're a national lab or something, um, it's, just, it's just difficult. It's not necessarily gonna be possible. But if you are, you know, a large uh, company, and it's, you know, you don't, um, the cost is like not prohibitive to you, you can pay to get all of this for the most part. Um, and that's, you know, not accessible <laughs> broadly. And, you know, last thing, and, you know, you can tell is maybe making these uh, on a real tight deadline. <laughs> um, you know, just thinking about, like, the current consensus in the energy space. Um, on one side, we have the demand growth. On the other side, we have dispersion. I think, you know, McGee uh, touched on dispersion a bunch yesterday as well as, well as other people. And, you know, like, dispersion instead of distributed just because you can apply it like a little more broadly, I feel like, but you know, I think it's really just semantics. Um, you know, on one side with demand growth, you have you know, potentially extreme weather driving demand growth uh, like load peaks, 
right? Now in the Southeast, you're not worried about the summer. You're worried about the two to three hour uh, winter morning when it is the coldest and electric heating is fully going and the sun hasn't risen yet, right? That's a completely different reliability paradigm than all the models are oriented towards, right? And if you wanna like change those models, you wanna update them, um, having access to data actually describing the system and what's going on is, is super helpful. Um, you know, and then on the dispersion side, it's the local weather, right? Uh, you have resources being built not next to load, which is generally good because like load is where people are and we've had a lot of problems in the past with the impacts of people living next to generating stations. I lived in Tennessee for a stretch um, and I lived next to what when it was built was the largest coal plant in the world. And it was on a really nice lake and there are all these signs like, do not go in this lake. <laughs> do not eat any fish in this lake. Um, and you know, you just, you see like the lived and real impact. Um, you know, you, we're talking about like community, there's a question sort of about like asthma or whatever and I think you mentioned, right? The, the um, you know, these local impacts of these stations. So it's not bad the stuff's being built further away, but it means like we need different transmission, we need more transmission, we need better optimization of the transmission, which I think we heard about some yesterday as well. You know, AARs are the first step down the GITS, uh, grid enhancing technologies uh, train. Um, and then yeah, you know, in the middle, existing infrastructure, right? Still wanna serve that, provide for that, uh, make sure everything keeps running, uh, you know, reliably as we transition forward. Um, it all sort of hinges on data in our minds, and I will uh, stop there. I forgot to put a contact slide in, but it's gridstatus.io, and it's Connor at gridstatus.io. <laughs> Thanks. I can repeat you too. Sure, yeah. Um, so like, I think the, the question was like, what's one kind of like technology, in a, uh, like technology data aspect integrated into grid status that you know, you'd like to do? And the other side, like what is a, like a policy or regulatory um, concept or something that you like to work in a grid status, is that right? Cool. Um, so on the first side, I think that, uh, <laughs> let's say one of like my personal ambitions uh, with the thing I'd like to develop at grid status on the technology side is just more clarity into natural gas infrastructure um, and, and delivery. Um, there are, for interstate pipelines, they all have websites where they describe the receipt and delivery of natural gas and the pipeline capacity at all these points, so they'd be the power plants or local distribution companies or whatever. Um, they're really difficult to use. That industry is pretty closed. It's not very welcoming to people coming in and trying to like disrupt anything. And we're not looking to disrupt anything, right? Just like make this data accessible. So I think on a technology side, I would really like to surface what is actually happening <laughs> on, on the pipelines and how is that like affecting or, you know, the, the grid. And then like the policy and regulatory side, I think that not in terms of like a key element or something new that we would provide, but just making things more accessible for folks. Um, like we see users from state, federal, and city offices um, using grid status. And you know, and when we sort of see what folks are doing, it's just looking for basic information. Uh, you know, to, you know, I mentioned this a little bit, but it's like, is this policy succeeding? You know, is, do we know what's happening here? And I think a, a future improvement, you know, something I really like to get to, is having a little more explanatory, um, sort of like a corpus of explanatory content, where when something's happening on the grid, we can sort of automatically generate or have a piece about why it happened, right? The why 
is really difficult when it comes to energy markets. Um, you know, you see a price spike, why? Um, and I think that that is something that, you know, could be really useful for policy and regula regulators. Right now it's lawyers and economists arguing back and back, back, and, yeah, back and forth in these filings, right? The actual data element is, you know, often non-existent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was about like when we pull data in, like the ETL process. Yeah, we're good. Um, you know, data data quality checks, and the answer is yes. Um, so price corrections, you know, we're managing that, backfilling data that's dropped or outliers. Um, you know, we have uh, a bunch of a learning learning system set up, and then also like the back end engineering side um, because sort of the um, like the core was built by someone whose whole thing was you know, data engineering, feature engineering, that clean data for machine learning. I feel like we had a really, uh, not lucky, but you know, a great start in that respect to make things um, clean and you know, have it be usable. Cool. All right, I am out of time, so thank you so much.